It is uh, 6.01 and I suggest that we start. So good evening, everybody. Thank you for so many of you connecting up. Uh, there are 197 of us currently connected. I am delighted to be starting at this new ethics debate. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start by handing straight over to Charles Bessonnet, the director of the French National Heritage Institute, who is continuing to work alongside ICOM France uh, for these professional events. Uh, thank you very much, um, Charles Bessonnet. More than ever, we're delighted to continue to collaborate with the, the team at ICOM France, and I would like to publicly congratulate you, Emily Girard, for your new role as chair of ICOM France. I am sure that you will be able to steer this boat as uh, well as your predecessor did uh, for many years. So congratulations for this mandate at ICOM France and I'm sure that these ethics debates will be able to continue at ICOM. We really enjoy them. Looking at museum policy or looking sometimes like this evening at much more technical topics, but they're all linked into the major challenges that we're facing, the challenge of sustainable development, the ecological transition, the energy transition, which requires a number of different uh, practices, heritage and conservation practices to change. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. We might have considered that this would be stricter technical discussion, but we wanted to have a larger format because when thinking about conservation standards, we can't be working alone. We need to be talking with other professionals in order to find the most pragmatic means of action, whilst also thinking about a more general framework so that we can continue to best preserve our collections while complying with all of our requirements for sustainable development and the energy transition. I think that this evening is uh, going to be uh, very uh, enjoyable. We've got glacial temperatures here in France. I'm sure that it's not the same across the world, but this will be a key topic today. Thank you so much for organizing this evening. Thank you to all of the speakers who will be speaking this evening. And I'm sure that we will be leaving this evening with new ideas that we will continue to discuss over the coming months with a number of larger concepts at the national and international levels in order to think about how we can best conserve our collections, take into account modern day challenges. I wish you all an excellent evening and I will be seeing you soon for new ethics discussions as we will be continuing over the coming months. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharla, for introducing this evening. As I said, I'm delighted to be opening this last ethics debate of the year. And uh, this is part of uh, a program that Juliette duval raoul has been running over the past years. And I really do congratulate her for her from the bottom of my heart. It seems obvious that we should continue with these fundamental discussions on the major topics facing our professions and contemporary changes. And I suggested that this first ethics debate under my new term in office be devoted to the question of the re-evaluation of conservation standards. This is a technical topic, as Charles said, but it's raising questions within the international museum community, and it could be debated at that level. For some time now, the climate crisis has pushed our museums to question the solutions we should propose to participate in a necessary and urgent change. ICON France has already devoted an evening to the issue of sustainable development, but we felt that it was important to come back to a very specific question, which is, yes, practical and technical, but also to, to question our way of conserving the collections in our care. The energy crisis is undoubtedly helping to accelerate this process of reflection, 
faced with a burning planet and soaring bills, if you like, how can conservation be environmentally conscious and sustainable? How can we continue to guarantee our primary missions in a profoundly changed environment? How can we adapt our conservation standards to what we're calling sobriety, energy conservation, which the media are talking about constantly? According to the French High Council for Climate, energy conservation or energy sobriety is an approach that aims to reduce energy consumption through changes in behavior, lifestyle and collective organization. So this question of sobriety really has an impact, profound impact on our lifestyles and our organizations. The government has set a target of reducing our energy consumption by 10% by 2024. This is just around the corner. It's therefore going to require a profound change in our lifestyles and our organizations that we need to come up with together and implement with conviction. The viability of our conservation standards, which were established 30 years ago in a completely different context, is one of the topics that we need to revisit. On the 6th of September, the Minister of Culture in France, uh, Ms. Rima Abdul Malak, also called on French professionals and the international museum community to address the issue of air conditioning in museum, museums and the conservation of collections. And she recalled the need for concerted positions on this topic. The purpose of this evening is to contribute to this national and international debate and to feed our common reflection on the establishment of new standards through the presentation of reflections and concrete actions. That's why we are working with a number of speakers and uh, we encourage you to debate with uh, what is said. I would like to thank in advance all of the speakers this evening for sharing their experience and for their commitment. Thank you also to Sandrine Boujard-Vallée, who's recently been elected to the Board of Directors at ICOM France, and she will be moderating this evening. I'd also like to thank the INP, the French National Heritage Institute, with whom we are renewing our partnership for the organization of this evening, with Charles Personnaz, its director, Severina Blenner-Michel, director of studies in the curational department, Emily Mum, a head of programming and scientific publications, and of course, Ellen Vassal, who's in charge of continuing education and is assistant to the director of studies for her commitment to the working group on sustainable development in ICOM France. And she will be concluding this evening. I thank her for that. Finally, for uh, the to, to wrap up this evening, I, I, I would like to thank Anna Claude Maurice, our permanent officer, for her precious work. And thanks to Antoine as well and to the entire office that's helped us to prepare this evening. Thank you very much uh, to our translators. Let me remind you that this evening will be translated into English and in Spanish for our international colleagues. And I've seen a number of people coming from other parts of the world. And thank you so much. I'm very touched by this. And thank you to our note takers for their efficient work, which means that we're going to be publishing this event uh, this evening. So we will be handing over to the speakers very shortly. I just wanted to share some news with you. Thanks to the support of the Shunu Foundation, we've been able to send material and equipment to Ukraine, which should be delivered in the coming hours. So this is great news, despite the difficulties. This is another action and I'm delighted to be able to share that with you. I'm not going to be uh, sharing anything else with you now, but there are almost 300 of you connected this evening and I'm going to be handing over to Sandrine to get stuck in with this topic today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are around 300 of us here. This clearly is a topic that has uh, been able to mobilize the international community, and this is great news. I would like to thank ICOM France for giving me the opportunity to moderate this evening. I am currently working as head of management of works and exhibitions at Centre Pompidou, and I'm co-coordinating sustainable development policy for the Centre Pompidou. Before introducing the speakers, I would like to remind you that in 2011, Stefan Mikowski wrote, in the future, standards will specify a process in order to 
take into account the context rather than the standards themselves. The context has changed if we look at different scientific studies. Ashwai, ICC, Bizul Group, for instance, have carried out studies, which has shown that majoritarily we currently have strict requirements with a relative humidity at around 50%, temperature at 21 degrees in winter, 24 degrees in summer, and changes are very slow in coming. Today, there's an emergency for energy conservation, and I think we can all agree on this. So the question is, how can we achieve this while also ensuring correct conservation of our heritage and collection collections? We have six speakers, professional speakers today, and uh, there will be a time of discussion, of question, question and answers after the three first speakers. We have David de Viome, who uh, uh, is Director General of the German Association of Museums and President of NEMO. We have uh, Caitlin Southwick. We have Katarina Koronski, Frederica Ladon, who's architect, member of the board of Icon France. Florence Bertin, head of the collections department at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. And uh, Anne Borges, we're going to be starting with Caitlin Southwick, who is founder and executive director of Kai Culture. You have a professional PhD in conservation and restoration of heritage from Amsterdam University. You've been working in for eight years now in sites across the world. And uh, you have uh, been um, working for the Vatican Museums, the Getty Conservation Institute, the Uffizi Gallery, and Rapa Nui. You are secretary of the working group on sustainability of the International Council of Museums and a climate reality leader for the Climate Reality Project. On 1st and 2nd of December, the first international conference on climate control was held, which you organized. What are your first impressions following various high quality presentations that I followed with great interest? What feedback have you received from the listeners and the professionals? Over to you, Caitlin. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sandrine, and thank you to ICOM France for hosting me. Um, bonsoir à tous. Uh, I am joining you also from France today, but unfortunately, my French is not yet uh, good enough to give my presentation, so pardon me for speaking English, but a huge thank you to the translators who are doing such a beautiful job and just the commitment to making this as accessible as possible, so thank you again. Um, uh, thank you again to Sandrine for bringing up the Climate Control Conference. Um, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the results of the conference and really um, amazed and uh, like we have so many people joining us today, how many um, how many people were interested in, in the topic. And of course, the most important part was the incredible speakers that uh, committed to joining the conference and sharing their knowledge and expertise with us and with the world. Um, during my presentation today, I will be touching on a few of the key takeaways. Um, I did want to mention that if you did not get a chance to check out the conference, it's uh, the whole recording is available on YouTube, so I just put the link in the chat. Um, please feel free to share far and wide. The important part about this is we get the information out there. So, um, you know, I, I have to say that um, I'm, I'm coming at you with two hats today. I, I, as mentioned, I am the founder and executive director of Key Culture, uh, the international nonprofit working in the nexus of sustainability and culture. And I'm also the secretary of the Working Group on Sustainability. So I'll be talking a little bit about both today. Um, but just to, just to begin with answering Sandrine's question, I think the most important things um, that that came out of this conference was a sense of community and a sense of unity. So I'm really, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some of the key takeaways, and um, I'll get, I'll get to, I'll get to some of that action in in the last part of my presentation. Um, but I first would like to take just a couple moments to introduce the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability um, and uh, the actions that we're working on right now. So I see we're already at this slide. So if you could go to the next slide, please. 
oh, sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in the second mandate period of the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability, we've been focused on creating an action plan for 2022 to 2030. Uh, we're also producing various webinars series, as well as focusing on our um, communications, including attending conferences such as this one and letting the community know what we're up to, as well as producing publications and um, including information about sustainability in the ICOM newsletters. Um, really, really impressed that the Secretariat in Paris did a carbon calculation and they're focusing on reducing their own carbon footprint, which I think is a really powerful statement for the rest of us to also address, measure and reduce our own carbon footprints. And then uh, I did want to let everyone know, because there have been a lot of questions about what's happening next. The Working Group on Sustainability has been given an extended period of six months for our mandate um, in order to figure out what those next steps are going to be, especially in some of the uh, larger discussions about uh, international committees within the role of ICOM. So stay tuned. We're not going anywhere yet. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I briefly wanted to, um, to give an outline of the action plan um, because there has been a lot of really great content and um, knowledge and experience put into this. And uh, this is an invitation for all of ICOM to take advantage of this template. Um, the action plan is that it is a template and it's really designed to be utilized by all of you whether you're on a national committee, an international committee, part of a regional alliance or an affiliated or a organization, or to take back to your own institution and adapt it to the needs of your organization. Um, we are currently seeking groups within ICOM to pilot. So invitation to ICOM France, as well as anyone else who is part of this call and involved with any of the ICOM uh, organizations or groups, we would love to get your feedback and input on um, how this template works for you. And I have just outlined a couple of the aspects of the of the um, of the action plan here. And in the next slide, please. Um, these are these are uh, these are quite quick. So sorry, we're just going to kind of skim through these. Um, these are also the uh, kind of where the action plan is coming from. As I mentioned, we are piloting this right now. So if you'd like more information, please do feel free to get in touch. I've put my um, contact information at the end of the slot at the presentation, and I'll also put it in the chat later. Um, next slide, please. And uh, these are the um, the specific areas within ICOM that the action plan is focused on. So this is all included in the document. So you can pick out if you are part of the executive board and international committee, et cetera. And it explains a little bit about how the uh, action plan can be adapted for you. And next slide, please. I also wanted to point out that um, ICOM International has just made a statement on climate activism. Um, I know that there was another statement that came out of Germany, um, but I wanted to highlight the one that ICOM International has put out. And I think that, it, you know, I know that today we're talking about the energy crisis and this is actually an entire complete uh, different discussion. And I actually was in a panel session last week about climate activism and museums. Um, but just in light of the various um, incidents that we've seen from around the world, I did just want to highlight this intersection because of course, as we know, sustainability is something that uh, touches us all in many different ways. And some of it can feel quite nuanced. And this is a prime example of that because well, I believe that all of us within the cultural sector very strongly believe that we have a role to play in the climate, uh, the climate crisis. And this is, of course, what we're looking at today is what actions we can take to help support energy efficiency, um, lowering our energy consumption to lower our carbon footprint to you know, work towards a better future. It's also can be uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to understand where we fit into some of these uh, discussions, especially when it comes to activism. So I just wanted to highlight this one part, which, which states that ICOM wishes for museums to be seen as allies in facing the common threat of climate change. 
And I think that a really, really powerful way that we can do that is practice what we preach. And this is why I'm so excited to be talking with you all today about this conversation of climate control and specifically um, how we can take action to reduce our carbon footprint by addressing our climate control and our loan agreements. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned really fast, we are piloting the uh, action plan. So this is just one last uh, push for anyone who'd like to um, help us check out the format, please do let me know. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. All right, back to the climate control conversation. And next slide. Um, we uh, all know more or less the history of climate control. We know that this started 50s, 60s, 70s to be um, part of this larger conversation of preventive conservation and that there was a lot of research and development on this issue with the advent of the HVAC system and also um, with several researchers in the UK looking at appropriate guidelines for their institutions. And we also know that these guidelines have been re-examined in the last 20 years to show that maybe they're not appropriate for everyone. So what's so interesting about this entire conversation of climate control that I found out was the my key takeaway from this conference is that we really are all on the same page. We understand that we don't need to have such strict ranges, that we don't need to have set points, that plus or minus two is, is not necessarily for collections on a larger scale. Of course, there are certain um, certain exceptions to this, various objects that are quite sensitive, but we also know that trying to maintain a climate in those tight ranges in large spaces is absolutely impossible. So if there are uh, if there are objects that are quite sensitive, the best thing to do anyway would be to put these uh, these sensitive objects in microclimates. Uh, next slide, please. And I think that what we what we're really looking at here in terms of the how we start making these changes is actually really asking ourselves why and we haven't already. And a lot of times what I've noticed is that institutions with climate control either have not readdressed their climate control in the last few years, or, um, sorry, if you could go back. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, institutions who have not addressed their climate control in the last few years, um, or people or institutions that maybe don't have conservators who don't know who set the climate control regulations in the first place. I was speaking to a registrar a couple days ago and asking him about loan agreements and their climate control conditions. And I asked him who, um, who ran the climate control. And he told me it was somebody who was in the HR department and facilities department. And I said, is that the person who's also responsible for making the decision on the climate control conditions? And he said, I don't no. And I said, well, do you know who made the choice to have these conditions in the first place? And he said, I, I don't know. It's always just been that way. And I think that that's a really dangerous thing for us to just keep going with our day to day because that's how it's always been. So one of the things that I'll also mention um, a little bit later is that it's really important for us to see this as an opportunity to be bold as um, our, my colleague at the ICOM working group presented in our, in our conference, it's time for boldness and it's time for us to start asking questions. So start by finding out what ranges are we using? Who set these and why? And when were they last changed? And that's really the starting point for looking at what, what we can do. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we initiated a project at Key Culture, so taking my ICOM hat off and putting my Key Culture hat on, um, called Getting Climate Control Under Control, because we realized that this is a topic that is not really able to be tackled by one individual or one individual institution. Many institutions cite the reason for not being able to make change as a, an obstacle from loan agreements. If you're not able to maintain certain specifications that are required by your 
partner museum, then your partner museum might not loan their objects to you. Interestingly, we saw during the conference that institutions who have made changes to their climate control conditions and have then notified their partner museums in loans have not had any negative feedback. Also interestingly, when we talk to different institutions who are using loan agreements, most of the loan agreements say something vague like um, the best conditions for the environment. We talked with insurance companies who said that they had absolutely no problem with what the ranges are. It's up to the conservators to have that information. We talked to the lawyers. They're not the ones who dictate what the ranges are. Really, it's up to us as conservators to start this conversation and to know what's best for our collections. So this, this um, project took a four-pronged approach to this issue of climate control, because as I said, we realized that this is a collective problem and needs a collective collaborative solution. It is not a, it's not going to be possible for museums all around the world to make the change unless we know we're making it together. The first part of the, of the project was to do a survey. So at the beginning of October, we released a survey. We collected over 200 responses from around the world, seeing what people were using and uh, basically in terms of their guidelines and why. It turns out there's very little consensus on um, not only what people are choosing to use, but also and why they're choosing to use it, but even more so what the guidelines actually say, which was fascinating. The um, big reaction we got to the survey was people responding to us, correcting us on what the guidelines were actually saying. So that was quite fascinating because apparently there's not even a lot of consensus on what the guidelines are. The second part, of course, was this conference. And I, as I've promised, I'll give you the key takeaways from the conference momentarily. At the conference, we launched a declaration. And the declaration is really a way for us as a sector to make a commitment to addressing and changing our loan agreements and our climate control conditions at our institutions. This was an initiative put forth by uh, renowned artist Tino Segal. And the idea is that we're going to make this a very public statement. So we're collecting signatures and then this will go to press and we will be publishing that the cultural sector and museums are taking a lead in the climate crisis by addressing our own practices and making changes to support energy efficiency and lowering our carbon footprint. And then of course, it's one thing to make a statement, but it's another thing to take action. And so at Key Culture, starting in January, we will be launching a pilot. Uh, we are inviting 50 museums from around the world to in, uh, join us in collective action. And the idea is that we will be basically mapping out how to make changes and then walking these institutions through the process of making the changes. And at the end of the pilot program, we will have 50 case studies and a methodology for all museums to adopt. So it's my sincere hope that by 2024, we will be able to help not only reduce the carbon, the energy consumption at museums by just 10%, but between 22 and 82%, because that's how much energy you can save by making changes in your climate control. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to focus in on the conference, um, starting off with who was there. And I have to say, once again, I was just absolutely overwhelmed by the support and brilliance of the contributors to the conference. Every person that I asked joined, um, which was a huge, huge honor for me, because what the idea behind this conference was willing to bring together the kind of leaders on this, the um, the some of the most um yeah, experienced and expert researchers, uh, scientists, also all of the authorities. So ICOM was there indeed, as well as AIC, AICCM, IIC, I call them all the acronyms, ASHRAE, BEZO, all of the, um, the authorities that we heard from earlier were represented, CCI as well as uh, Stefan Mikowski was also there. And then, of course, we had to bring in all of the stakeholders. So we had panel sessions with museum directors, with preventive conservators, with uh, insurance agents and lawyers, as well as with facilities managers. Um, next slide, please. So I've mentioned that I wanted to give you guys some of the key takeaways, and I'll, I'll um, kind of end my end my talk here a little bit, but. 
what was so interesting to me was that there were a few themes that really emerged from this conference. And the first one that was that really talks about what uh, touches on what we were talking about earlier today is this idea of standards or best practices or guidelines. And I like to put these all in parenthesis in quotation marks because it, it turns out standards and guidelines Guidelines exist, standards per se do not necessarily exist as blanket statements. And it's incredibly dangerous for us to think that's the case because it turns out that what Gary Thompson was talking about was relevant for British museums in the 1960s and 70s. And the 60-60 rule came from the paintings collection at the National Gallery. It was not meant to be intended for museums in Australia or in Brazil. And so having these guidelines and pointing to numbers really actually takes away from our knowledge and expertise as conservators, because we are really the only people who can assess collections and tell what is best for those collections in terms of climate control and the conditions they need to be in. I loved what Cecilia Winter said, and also this goes back to what Stefan was saying and was quoted earlier, that guidelines should be a process, not numbers. This is hugely, hugely important for us to break away from this idea that we can look at a table in a book and it can tell us what we should keep our, can, our collections at. Because actually what we need to be doing is looking at the collections and asking the objects, how are you guys doing today? Are you cold? Are you hot? Are you dry? Are you feeling a little uh, wet? What can we do to make the collections feel good? Not necessarily what can we do to make ourselves feel good. And it is a safety net to have these guidelines. It is indeed something that we can point to and it takes some of the weight off. It takes some of the responsibility off. I know it's scary making these choices, but as conservators, that is our job. But of course, we don't have to do this alone. And this is where, um, where we are here for support. As I said, the real best practice is actually tailoring your conditions to the needs of your collection and to your geographic location and the season. The most important thing that we can do is recognize which objects are sensitive and create microclimates. Stefan also talked about during the conference that there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's no way to keep strict conditions for, for, um, for sensitive objects if you're trying to maintain those conditions in an entire museum. So if you really do have materials and objects that are sensitive and need very tight ranges, those should be in microclimates anyway. So it's really important for us to recognize our own role in this, in asking the questions about where our collections care protocols came from, and then also figuring out what is the best for our specific collections. The other thing that we learned that is teamwork and collaboration are key. As I said, this is not something that we can do alone. As a facilities manager, you need to be talking to your conservation staff. As a conservator, you need to be talking to your registrars. As registrars, you need to be talking to your admin and your finance people. This is something that's gonna take a collective effort within institutions, and I believe a collective effort within our, um, our cultural sector on an international scale. The other thing that was really inspirational is that change is possible. There are a lot of institutions already making those changes and have had huge successes. So there's really nothing to be scared of, especially if you're doing this with support, especially if you're doing it with support of a preventive conservator. And as I mentioned, the most important takeaway, and one thing that I was really surprised to learn, but really pleasantly surprised to learn, is that we are all on the same page. When I put this conference together, I was inviting people who I didn't know what their opinions were about this topic, but I knew that they were an authority in the matter and that they were someone that people would listen to. I half expected some of the conversations to be more um, debates <laughs> rather than just people agreeing with each other, but it was amazing. Unanimously, we are on the same page. The cultural sector agrees that it is safe and it is necessary to make change. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I did want to just highlight putting my ICOM hat back on um, the incredible contribution from my colleague Louis Sousa to the conference. And what I was really impressed with that he was mentioning was that when it comes to ICOM's role in this, 
ICOM is not here to be the authority on climate control. We are not here to tell you what standards to adhere to or what guidelines to use or what is best for your collections. Only you can know that. And it was really powerful to hear um, Luisa's perspective, particularly coming from Brazil and showing examples of institutions that perfectly preserve their collections without climate control or HVAC systems, and also some of the dangers of HVAC systems and climate control. And of course, we know in Brazil, the museum that went into flames because of a faulty HVAC system. So I think that Louise said it most beautifully when he said that it's up to us and that we need a certain boldness and that it's time to time to step up and uh, yeah, get some get some boldness in, in having these conversations. Next slide, please. Okay, I think I'm right at time, so I will wrap up here, but I wanted to thank you all so much for inviting me tonight, and um, please do get in touch if you have any questions, and if you'd like to participate in the ICOM Action Sustainability Action Plan, um, please send an email to icomsustainability at gmail.com, and of course, if you have any questions for me, let me know. I already shared the uh, recording of the conference in the chat, so please do check that out, and if uh, we will also be sharing the survey um, uh, results on our website uh, early next year. So thank you so much for inviting me and I look forward to continued discussions. Merci beaucoup Kathleen pour cette intervention. Nous avons, uh, thank you very much Kathleen for what you've just shared. We have got one question on the chat. Please do ask your question. Because as I said at the end, we'll have a series of um, questions at the end of the first three speakers. So I'm really struck by one of uh, your, your one of the things you said is that things have always been this way. Things have always been this way. I think that does really summarize the issue that we're facing. I think in all of our, in our professional life, in our training situations, people have always told us, well, these standards here, they've just always been this way. And so perhaps we need to ask ourselves the question, what is blocking us to, and what's stopping us from going further? I've also picked up what you're talking about, the need for collaborative solutions, not just at a European level, but also at an international level, because the issue varies between different continents. And then I think throughout this evening, we're going to keep coming back to this, but one of the obstacles ultimately is the political decision-making. I currently work and uh, where I currently work and in previous jobs, we talk about energy conservation and we're being asked to reduce uh, consumption by 10% at least. 10% is perhaps not really enough at all in terms of the level that we need to hit. But in terms of discussions that we can have internally, I'd encourage you all to respond to these different questions. But when we have to change uh, loan agreements or a paragraph on preventive conservation and what we're asking um, borrowing institutions to do, it's at that time where, the, where people say, well, actually, we can't do that. In, internally, we can't make this change on our own. We have to change with others. Um, this has to be accepted by everybody. It's not possible for us to take the first step, at least in France. I think people feel that way, because if we do that, we might be, um, we might put our reputation in danger and not be able to have any more loans. Anyway, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you very much. You're going to be staying with us for the questions after the next two speakers. And so I'd now like to welcome David Willem 
I can't see him on the screen. Ah, there you are. Very good. Very good. Delighted to, to see you, David. Thank you for being with us. You are the managing director of the German Museum Association, I have been since 2017. Since 2014, you've been the chairman of the board of the European Network of Museum Organizations, NEMO. Before that, you were the general secretary of the Swiss Museum Association and of ICOM Switzerland for 11 years. You studied art history and museology as well as business administration, and you have extensive experience in various institutional networks. You represent the museum sector in the German Cultural Council and are vice president of the Swiss Center for Cultural Heritage. So I have a question for you to begin the presentation. In terms of what, what are the levers and obstacles for deconstructing the standards that we've been following and teaching for 30 years? How can we bring these issues of resigning standards to an international level? Thank you so much, Sandrine. Uh, I will be answering your question in a moment. Uh, thank you very much, Anne Claude, for organizing this conference. And thank you, Emily, for inviting me. I'm going to be answering this question drawing on the German experience. The German museums organization, the Museumsbund, has developed and proposed new general conservation standards. Uh, this has been difficult to draft, obviously. We wanted to take the time to listen to all actors and schools of thought. There was a certain reluctancy. There have been tests museums at the moment. These standards have now been made mandatory within the museums, in, in the Lander, in the Lender, which are the federal states within Germany. And um, most specifically in the largest uh, German uh, land. The Swiss uh, Museums Association, and we'll be hearing from my colleagues shortly, has uh, taken these standards and has even translated them into French. And this is a real honor for us. I will be sharing a link to the Swiss Museums Association at the end of my presentation. So you can read these standards in French. You can also read them in, in German on our own website. So if we're able to reconsider the climate control regulations we had until now is because the climate was favorable previously. This is a museum of the 20th century. I don't know if you've heard about this. This museum of the 20th century is under construction in Berlin at the moment. It's still a work site. It's between the Philharmonic, the yellow building by Hans Scharoun, and on the other side, there's the new National Gallery, the National Art, Art Gallery, that I'm sure you will have heard of. And this Museum of the 20th Century that you can see here, this is by Bertel Bouderon, which is uh, very worthy of its name. It's an architectural gesture aimed at transparency with open doors. There's a question of sustainable development and energy crisis, which is completely absent. This is 24 seven air conditioning in this building, which is mandatory in law. It has become to a certain extent, the caricature of a museum that we should not be building. It's being built at the moment with incredible German bureaucracy, specifically in Berlin, which prevents any modification of plans. So it's under construction at the moment. It is the museum of the 20th century as we should never be building it anymore. It's not just my opinion. Everybody is talking about this in the culture sector, whether it's the media or museums. We hope that this will be the last museum of the 20th century. 
it will be presenting uh, collections from the 20th century. That's a whole other thing um, and art for the 20th century. But we hope that it will be the last museum of the 20th century in its design. And these are discussions that the cultural and museum community are talking about at the moment. When you talk about this museum, we don't talk about the, the content anymore. We talk about the, the energy horror that uh, it represents. If we look at another slide now, which is an, an opposite trend, a museum taking into account sustainability, you probably haven't heard of this museum. It's under construction. It doesn't exist yet. It's in debt mold. It's an outdoor museum with a huge park. You can see the, the um, visitor center and the collections site in the middle there. The objective is that in its very construction, that it will produce more energy than it consumes with a minimum carbon footprint. So the questions of sustainability are omnipresent across German museums with this uh, blue sticker that you can see on the on the screen there have been a number of sustainability awards for this museum we hope that it will be a model that will inspire similar museums in the future we are talking almost exclusively about sustainability now when we think about museums an example in the next slide the network of which we are part. Someone just asked me the name of this museum. It's the Freilichtsmuseum. But let me come back now to this network. You can see a number of different names on the screen. This is a network of cultural institutions funded by the German Department of Culture and Media, or the Ministry of Culture and Media, if you like. It was created in 2020. And uh, the Deutsche Museumsbund is part of this, along with a number of other institutions from media and museums, networks, etc. The aim is to action, to get all, mobilize all of German networks to reduce consumption by 65 percent by 2030 compared to 2020. So the target is over 10 years to motivate different actors and to, to have political pressure as well in order to have this 65 percent decrease in CO2 by 2030. Let me move on to what we're doing at the German Museums Association. Now here you can see our scientific body, which is called Museums Kunde. This is a scientific publication. This dates back to 2020. We did not wait until climate activists began uh, targeting museum artworks to start thinking about our practices, our cultural practices. And we also did not uh, wait until this year to think about the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals, particularly in terms of climate change. This is theoretical reflection, but with uh, more concrete applications through two projects. If you move forward, we have one project linked to the energy crisis in Germany. The energy crisis is particularly prevalent given the fact that Germany is, or at least was very dependent on Russian gas. So one uh, project is associated with energy crisis and the other is associated with climate protection. We're carrying out these projects in parallel linking them through a very small project that still has high impact. If we move on to the next slide, this is what we call a Klima Corridor in German, which we could call uh, the ranges, uh, the climate control ranges 
that uh, we use. Uh, we call, I really like the German term Klima Corridora. It's uh, quite original. So let me just say a little bit briefly about these three projects. So firstly, the project about climate protection. We've implemented a working group of 70 experts. We asked around our network if experts were willing to take part. Often we're looking for 50 to 70 people and 30 accept taking part. But as Caitlin said earlier, we had this experience as well. We asked people if they wanted to commit for two years. It was a two year program to draft publications and recommendations, etc. And all 70 people said, yes, I would love to. And they're still working. So the three things that we're looking to finish before next year is firstly a catalogue of measures on uh, climate protection in museums. It's very specific with regulations for exhibitions, events. I'm sorry, I'm used to speaking in German. I'm uh, struggling to find my French words. Uh, buildings, functioning, collections, research, and cultural outreach. So we're preparing these at the moment. They will be released in May next year. We're developing a variety of instruments. It's nice to talk about measures that we need to be implementing, but we need to be giving museums the means, the resources they need to do this. And then also we're thinking about certification because it's the authorities and the supervising bodies that have asked us for certification that could perhaps help them to motivate museums in implementing the measures that we're proposing. This would allow supervisory bodies to force, to a certain extent, or at least in any case, support certain institutions on the basis of specific certification. We're not doing our own certification. That's not really of interest for us, but we want the supervisory bodies to take into account all of the measures we propose so that we can have a sort of bottom up approach from museum professionals up to the supervisory body, bodies and the supervisory body, bodies will be working in a top down approach, agreeing with these measures and implementing a framework to promote their application. The second project is about the energy crisis. We started in the month of June of this year. We published a, a call for ideas just before the summer. Since the war in Ukraine, there have been energy difficulties that started already. So we asked people for ideas so that we could save energy. After the summer, these ideas and other energy saving measures were published in a sort of catalog quite specific. This is for the short term for this winter. And museums implementing this are able to promote this uh, to their public with these stickers that you can see on the screen. And we're sending these out still. And by the 15th of December, all German museums implementing these measures should have received these stickers so that they can stick it on their doors or communicate around this issue. So the visitors also are able to do what they can to save energy. And it's for museums that are implementing the vast majority of our suggestions showing that they're working towards this 20% target in Germany, unlike the 10% targets in French in energy savings. 
there are other activities around the energy crisis project. We have intense lobbying so that museums are considered to be institutions. And we've been working on emergency plans that will be able to be rolled out at the start of next year or later if necessary. And then we worked uh, with this 70 person working group, 20 people working on energy crisis, 70 on climate protection on this Clima Corredora project. And I'm going to be presenting the main content now. It's this recommendation on energy savings by introducing extended climate security zones for climate control in museums. It's based on a very simple point that we move from a single set point, as we say in, in, in German as well. So instead of having a single set point, we are suggesting that there's a range of values, a dual set point. Even this in Germany was a paradigm shift. We went further still with very precise figures. Generally speaking, there are a number of different conditions that need to be respected, but generally speaking, we can have temperatures between 15 degrees if people are not working or visitors in the space, 18 degrees if people are working or museum visitors are present, present up to 26 degrees. I'm not going to go into the details of these recommendations because there are a number of conditions, but the general recommendation is to have not just one temperature that we are targeting all year round, but to have a minimum operating temperature of 15 or 18 up to 26. And in terms of humidity, relative humidity, it's from 40 to 60% with potential variations. If you look at the next slide, um, with plus or minus five degrees Celsius over a 24 hour period and plus or minus 2% over a 24 hour period for relative humidity. This may not seem extraordinary. I, I called it a paradigm shift, but these thoughts have been in the pipeline for a number of years. What's interesting here is that we propose these recommendations and there was almost no criticism because we'd heard these criticisms before. We had a very large working group with 70 people. We asked large museums to be represented so that we could hear their voices. We asked professional associations for or trade associations for conservators, construction industry, professionals working on conservation more generally. We asked all of these experts to join the discussion. We had three one day sessions in order to hear all of the different points of view, which meant that we were able to implement this very broadly in museums because all of the participants became ambassadors of these new standards. For us, this was a moment of consecration where our recommendations were accepted and made mandatory just a few weeks later by one of the lands in Germany. This is unheard of in political administration. Normally it takes several months, if not years. We had not even contacted them. They read to the recommendations and made it mandatory, at least for the duration of this energy crisis for this winter. I've almost reached the end now, 
But you can see that the real challenge is to go from the short term to the long term. I think if we'd been presenting these recommendations for the long term, we might have encountered difficulties. If we're presenting them for short term in situations where we might not have much energy for museums, they are more likely and it's much easier to implement what we're suggesting. To finish, let me say that it is possible to propose new standards under certain conditions. The environment needs to be favorable. The entire sector is talking about sustainable development and the energy crisis. These measures need to be proposed and not necessarily mandatory in one of the land in it has become mandatory but we're proposing these measures and we say test them, develop them. And you'll see in, in Switzerland, there will be a structured federal period of testing and development. So we're presenting these measures as temporary measures without hiding that we think that they should be long-term and become the norm. And we found a common denominator between all of the different points of view. What played an important role was that our organization, the museum organization, represents the entire museum community. It's a neutral space representing all of the different organizations that count in this field. We asked experts sent by these organizations not to sign the recommendations in their own names, that they're working in collaboration with their organization and all of the other associations in Germany. This has simplified things. The most important thing for all uh, museum associations is to do bottom-up work. This is recommendations made by the professionals themselves and not by other parties. I think that's everything that I wanted to say today. I would like to thank you for listening and uh, let me put the link in the chat that I was talking about. Thank you very much, David. That was really very interesting and very helpful. So, I could perhaps just ask you a couple of questions that are directly linked to what you've just said, just um, straight up like this. Uh, we're being asked if natural history museums have been included in your study, and if so, what was their feedback? Of course, we work with all museums, and in Germany, art museums are perhaps only 10 to 12 percent of the 7,400 museums in Germany. So the question should really be, have we worked with art museums? And yes, the answer is yes. Yes, we really did invite all museums and they gave us a very, very positive feedback. The, the truth is, I didn't say this earlier, is that a lot of museums already working on a range, on a climate control range, when they're not yet obliged to do so. For the, for the moment, they have to have very specific uh, numbers, very specific values. But the reality is that in most museums, it's virtually impossible to have a temperature or humidity levels that are exact and precise. So in, in reality, most museums were waiting and for an institution, a representative institution, uh, could, they were waiting for them to take the first step. I, I, I agree with what Caitlin said earlier, we need to be bold and, and then things actually go very well. Thank you very much. Another question would be that in your studies, has the Association of Registrars in Germany been involved? No, we worked with the Association of Conservatives and Restorers because they had, we thought, uh, the most criticisms. Um, 
we were able to to deal with that and in the end they supported all of our recommendations all, every one of them now of course these recommendations are linked to a number of conditions of course there are general recommendations but the collections of different museums are very different there's many different kinds of conservation requirements i'm not a specialist in this area at all but we give a general guideline and this guideline is supported by everyone we haven't had a single criticism a, a single negative uh, response after this presentation and we were quite worried about that because when we presented it the text to our board uh, we were quite hesitant we'd really worked very in detail on the recommendation we talked about every word of the recommendation and the board said to us no no don't 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 publish that straight away we're going to check that in our own institution just to be sure that it works okay so it took us a certain amount of time but in the end from the time we'd published it we had only support so that's a very positive message. Thank you very much. So an, another question would be on the ground, how does it go? Does, how are things going? Is there um, a support and a monitoring of, of what's going on? Well, it has to be said that this is one of our limits, limitations. We've got 7,400 museums. We've got 18,000 different staff members. So uh, we can't see what's actually happening on the ground. Of course, one of the recommendations that we give is to monitor what happens. It's not us that's going to do that, but the museums themselves. And we do that in collaboration with the associations uh, of uh, conservators and restorers so that they can collect data and uh, contact information, but we are not able to coordinate monitoring for the moment anyway. Okay, so that's, that's it in terms of questions for the moment. David, thank you very much for sharing with us. So we're now we're going to welcome Katerina Kosinski and Natalie Bashlin. Natalie, you are Chief Conservator Restorer at the Kunstmuseum in Bern, a lecturer at the Oschule de Kunst in Bern. You hold a doctorate from the University of Bern and you conduct research, teach and publish on the subjects of painting technique and conservation and restoration, the transport of fragile paintings and the history, theory and ethics of conservation and restoration. At the same time, I'm going to introduce Katarina Kosinski, who is the Secretary General of ICOM Switzerland and the Swiss Museum Association and has been since 2020. You studied journalism and political science and you worked for 10 years in management positions at the University of Zurich. I've also got a question for you to get you going. You are launching a museum climate platform with the aim of encouraging exchanges between museum professionals. How will it work and how will the content be structured? So it's over to you. Yes, thank you, Sandrine. Thank you for that question. Thank you to the whole team for this invitation. I'm going to speak English if you want to change your interpretation language. Once again, thank you very much for hosting us tonight and giving us the opportunity to talk about our project, which is really work in progress. I need to highlight this because we will have our kickoff meeting this Thursday even though we will try to give you an idea of what we have planned. Next, oh, this is the next slide already, thank you. <laughs> so I will um, talk briefly about from where we started, why do we do this? As it has been uh, the case in many countries, I think, the challenges museums are facing in a context of the energy crisis have not been perceived by our national authorities. This was the reason why ICOM Switzerland um, has been developing political initiatives since July 22, just to raise the awareness on the policy level. Um, to make our point clear, we needed reliable data on how the energy crisis affects museums. So we started to talk to several museums in Switzerland and we quickly realized that this was a difficult matter there was a huge um, 
need for museums to exchange on how to measure energy consumption, on exchange information, on finding new approaches, how to deal with it. And um, if that wasn't enough to start our new platform to launch our project, the last missing piece was then the publication of the new recommendations by the German Museum Association, as uh, David Viom just outlined. This provided us with the background we needed to kickstart our new platform, Climate Conditions in Museums. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, that's one too far. One back, please. Uh, something, and sorry. So, uh, something went wrong. Could you go to the next slide? Pas les buts, mais la... Oui, notre approche. Merci. Um, the idea was really to find 15 museums across Switzerland that would be willing to apply the Klima Corridore we just heard about, um, and then that they would monitor the effects of these adapted climate conditions, be it in terms of energy consumption or um, impact on the collections, just to gather really reliable data on this. We have now almost 60 museums willing to join and we will discuss on how we will proceed together this Thursday as we really want to have a high level involvement of museum professionals and a high level of participations by museums. The idea is really to go the whole journey together to learn from each other along the way and to draw the joint summary at the end. Now, could you please go back to the slide before? I'm sorry, something went wrong here. Oui, merci. So this brings us to the goals of our project. We really want to obtain a better understanding on um, how to deal with adapted climate conditions to get a better database to really encourage interdisciplinary exchange within a wide range of museums experts, be it technicians, professionals from the fields of restoration, conservation, facility managers, and so on. It's really important for us to adopt a pragmatic approach throughout the whole project. We didn't want to develop a framework in advance on a theoretically, um, on a theoretic basis. We really wanted to involve museums from scratch, to have museums professionals as co-project leaders, as co-entrepreneurs on this journey. And in the end, if you can also contribute to shaping cultural, cultural policy decisions, I think we will have achieved a lot. So this is just a short introduction. I will now gladly hand over to Natalie. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Katarina. So I'm going to go into more of the content of what we're going to talk about next Thursday. So this is in two days. So I'm afraid my French is a bit mediocre, but I decided uh, just at the last minute that I would speak French. So I hope this will be okay for you. So please can I have the next slide. Thank you. What's uh, important and what we need to make possible is that we need to act ecologically without uh, threatening the objects in the collection. So I think that we all understand that we need museums that are more environmentally friendly. We want to encourage the air conditioning of museums through passive approaches. Big museums consume a lot of electricity and they have more responsibility in this area. And air conditioning units uh, 
and the, their eff effectiveness and efficiency depends a lot on the building in which they are. So you know one of the we, you know, all know one of the fundamental issues is that the climatic standards change depending depend on groups of materials, and then materials are not homogenous. And recently, in recent years, the need to present works of art and culture from different periods and therefore different materials has increased. Next slide, please. So about ten years ago, uh, Stefan Michalski, who's a specialist of conservation, uh, summarized the standards of climate uh, conditions in a very interesting and amusing way. He classified, uh, he gave two classifications of one size fits all, which is uh, very interesting. It's, it fits all collections, but is never adapted or customized for any collection. And then there is the second aspect, which is a kind of between the two, which is kind of like ready to wear uh, kind of approach. And then there's the custom fit approach. There are three levels that he identifies, one size fits all, ready to wear and custom fit, where this is all adapted to the institution and the materials. So this solution is more complex to develop. It may be more expensive. At least it might seem that way. Next slide, please. So in practice, the one size fits all solution has been required for exhibitions and the custom fit approach has been for storage. Um, Here's a, a view of the storage in Rotterdam, where you can access uh, the objects depending on the type of material, and they have different climatic conditions depending on the material. So this is the current uh, recommendation of the German uh, Museum Association linked to the energy crisis. And similar guidelines are already applied in many museums. They can be compared to the environmental directives that are recommended by ICOM and ICC, but they put the emphasis on the stable is safe concept, which uh, takes into account fluctuations and tries to avoid them. This seems to me that it is going to be a requirement for broad acceptance by professionals in Switzerland. The directives of the Museum Association take into account stable is safe with a one size fits all approach, which is a, a broadened understanding of the Lima Corridor that we, David, talked about earlier. The Climate conditions, some climate conditions are going to require uh, specific uh, conditions or such as very specific climate needs or specific climate definitions. The climate ranges put forward for saving uh, energy in a very tailored way is important. So what do I mean by this? We need to develop effective solutions to save electricity. You can see on the left here the mapping of energy uh, consumption um, with the Fine Arts Museum. And you can see here uh, the energy use during the summer. And then you can see on the right uh, the daytime is in green and the black is at night time. So we consume a lot of energy for uh, air conditioning during the daytime. And one of the reasons is that the building is not well insulated because it comes from 19, it was built in 1983. And we want to and need to reduce uh, consumption, energy consumption. So the discussion 
that we need to have is to take needs to take into account all stakeholders and all disciplines. Perhaps I could add that we didn't have an explosion here when we all worked together. We need to bring the different specializations together. In terms of loans for collections, we need transparency between museums. We need relevant monitoring. We don't necessarily need to calculate due points or technical documentation, but we need good data on the exhibition halls. Sometimes we discover that what we've agreed in contracts and agreements is not uh, the same as what's been measured on site. So how do we get there? I want to suggest that the climate of the future is not a, a range of indicative values, but it's going to be the fruit of the collaboration of all participants who are going to collect data and experience and assess them and develop them and in order to imagine relevant solutions. That's what we're trying to do with a large group of museums in Switzerland. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the two of you for this very informative presentation. We are now going to take some time to hear some live questions. We are therefore handing over to the floor if anybody has any questions. Are there no questions live from the floor? Otherwise, there's a question in the chat. Do you currently know what proportion of your energy consumption you can or hope to save by uh, the weakening of conservation standards? No, not yet. And uh, as uh, David uh, Viome uh, was saying, this is uh, a process rather than a methodology. And we're not just looking at numbers. It's also incredibly important that all change all change uh, needs to be monitored so that we can see so that we can see what savings we are making. This is very important. I think that was the question. Did I understand it correctly? Yes, I think that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I feel that you have understood uh, the question. You've responded in part with the data that you currently have. And I imagine that this will evolve in the future. And Sarah's saying, yes, thank you. You have answered Sarah's question. We still have a little bit of time for one or two questions. Yes, Mr. Ezrati, over to you. You have raised your hands and I would like to give you the floor. Please turn your microphone on. Yes, here we go. The microphone is now switched on. This energy crisis uh, is an opportunity for museums and conservation, especially for lighting. We are returning to natural lighting, which uh, could potentially avoid the use of electricity for lighting with new materials. Yes, 
Sorry for the technical issue there. A lot of muse museums are switching to LED as it's the end of fluorescent lights. The energy savings are not a huge when it comes to fluorescent lighting, but if we're talking about LED lighting, then we can actually uh, make huge savings. We can actually even choose to only light up works if someone is in front of them, and we can use natural lighting as much as possible without having to have artificial lighting switched on all the time. If we do have lighting at the moment, we're protecting ourselves from heat, and uh, we need to learn how to use lighting correctly. The energy crisis is pushing museums today to make energy savings and to change lighting. It's not just about changing the light bulb. We need to have a new reflection, a new thinking about lighting. And we need uh, lighting management, which we don't currently have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ezoati, for talking about this issue of lighting management, which is definitely part of the climate uh, discussion today. Uh, a question for Natalie. Natalie, could you please develop the um, advantages and disadvantages comparison com in terms of climate control versus construction? I saw that very quickly on one of the slides. I believe that, in my opinion, there is a correlation. Tell me if I've misunderstood, but I believe that there is a correlation between buildings that are unsuitable for art. A lot of museums are in this uh, in this uh, case. Uh, so the museum of the 20th century, as we were saying earlier. And there's a very high correlation with strict standards within these buildings where it is very difficult to manage climate control and it's quite problematic. Was, was that the question? Did I answer that? I believe that it, it was a, an answer, but I'm going to ask uh, Pauline a Chasson, who asked uh, this question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it offers uh, clarification I hadn't fully understood previously, so thank you. Another question, what position has INP, the French National Heritage Institute, taken in terms of the conservation sector Will continuing education become uh, the norm with a master's in preventive conservation? Elena, could I could I answer perhaps? I am not certain that I will be able to give a very clear response uh, given the answers that we have just had with ongoing reflection and the questions that we are tackling. Yes, we're thinking about revisiting standards. This is not new, but the way that the community has taken hold of this and the tools that our German Swiss and Swiss colleagues are developing are incredibly interesting to support us in decision making as people in charge of collections that we need to conserve over time. So yes, of course, uh, training and particularly continuing education with degrees in preventive conservation, for instance, discuss these issues in very clear ways and relay information on the responses that are, that are given. I'm not going to be able to talk on behalf of my conservation restoration colleagues at the INP, so I hand over to them. 
Um, Sandrine, there's a question from Frédéric Ladonne. I just wanted to answer the question. I work at the Ecole du Louvre on the Master in Preventive Conservation, and there's a non-dogmatic approach to this. Thank you, Frédéric, for adding this information. David uh, Viome also raised his hand. Uh, yes, I just wanted to go back to what uh, Jean-Jacques Jean Israti uh, was saying uh, early, th that the energy crisis has really shone a light on certain issues. In Germany, we're losing a lot of money it's motivating us to respond quickly on the one hand, and also we're losing a lot of money there. Uh, there's a fund of several billion euros available in Germany for the reorganization of uh, energy infrastructure within museums. This fund will be used next uh, year in order to pay energy bills so that we can just continue to function. It's very frustrating on the one hand, we're motivated to respond very quickly, but we will not be able to respond well because some of the money intended for renovation is actually going to be used just to pay bills. It's a little bit frustrating. I just wanted to share this where we're losing money because of this and losing time as well. Sandrine, thank you very much. There's a question from Charlotte Martin de Fangin. Yes, sir. good evening. I am working as a temporary office in uh, officer in conservation restoration. I have worked a lot with students this year, alerting that things are going to be changing, that are already changing. I'm trying to raise awareness of uh, collection monitoring, if we do not look very closely what's happening to our objects, we, we need time, we need resources for this, we need to have observations that are perhaps more suited to monitoring any changes in line with environmental variations. With We've been thinking about how we can adapt collections monitoring and observations in we're also asked to take a stance sometimes in terms of quantitative data, which goes beyond simple empirical observation. Often we are asked to do this quite quickly. That's uh, what I have to say on this topic. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, switching to English. Um, I wanted to respond to David's comment, uh, which I think is a really important point about the, the financial picture of this. But um, before, I'd also love to uh, follow up with what Charlotte was saying about, um, you know, the, the requirements of, of uh, condition reporting and collections care. And um, this, this also circles back to earlier conversations about just more transparency and communication amongst museums. And we need to be sharing data in a clear uh, in a clearer way so that we can be comparing apples to apples rather and making sure we're uh, we're comparing comparable data so that we have better data sets and we can work towards benchmarking in the sector. Um, but going back to what David was saying, I think this is a hugely important point, the financial aspect. And this is really, you know, there, there are two things that I see as being the bottlenecks for why we haven't made change. One is money and the second is fear. And often those go hand in hand. And when we're looking at um, this particular conversation of climate control, and also with lighting, it's a really interesting discussion because a lot of institutions I've talked to about lighting say, well, we can't afford to change over to LEDs. But that's short-term thinking, and we have to start looking at long-term thinking. And yes, it can be scary to put an upfront investment into you know, changing out all of your lights for LEDs because they're more expensive. And maybe that investment will pay off in one year or two years or five years. But those are the types of things that we have to start have to start um, accepting and also looking at solutions outside of the box. I mean, there are so many organizations now that will come in and put in more sustainable um, operations or facilities or installations and then 
take money based off of the savings you make. And Signify is a really great example of this in terms of lighting. And um, I, it's, it, this is a, just one example of great programs. They will come in and install all new LEDs in your institution, and then you just pay for using the lights. And they're responsible for the maintenance, the um, equipment, um, and the installation. And there are a lot of other companies, private companies that you can apply for funding and they'll come in and make upgrades to your systems and then just take a cut of your energy savings. And that's how we have to start looking at this. We can start taking the money for making these changes out of our energy budget because we know that's tripling right now. So if we've got funds to help us pay our energy bills, maybe we can put some of that into, you know, not being pro, not being re reactive, but being proactive. And I think that the money, the money component was interesting. Um, also, in our colleague from uh, from uh, Switzerland was talking about the, you know, the it it costs more to make um, these more tailored uh, plans, as it were. You know, the you have to invest in a preventive conservator to come into your institution and make a tailored plan rather than just pointing to a number in a book. But once again, this goes to that cost benefit analysis. And we have to start thinking about actually we're going to be saving X hundreds of thousands of euros. And so maybe it is okay to put some money into, into conservators. And also, isn't that a nice thing for us as professionals to not only be valued, but also to be able to, um, you know, make a living off of, off of our knowledge and our, our jobs. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Perhaps uh, there's a couple of final questions concerning the Swiss platform. When did it start? And uh, how uh, is communication managed? Is there a regulator or can anybody use that platform? Natalie, sorry, I've not understood. Could you repeat it? What year did the Swiss platform start? We're starting. Kickoff is Thursday, this Thursday. It's not started yet. In two days. And uh, what will be the pace after this? We've not decided yet because this is just the kickoff. We're very open. We do not know if there will be debates or if there will be a consensus. So it will depend. There are 60 museums that will be discussing together and we will be making a decision. We believe that there will be working groups organized in order to determine the frequency of discussions. We're going to need to be working quite quickly. That's the issue. That's the plan in any case. We've not yet decided whether it's going to be two weeks, one month. Thank you very much, Natalie. A question from Benoit de Papel for David. For humid areas, have you excluded ranges from 45 to 65% instead of 40 to 60%? I, I replied by chat, says David, but at a national level, we believe that these are very general guidelines and there are all kinds of variations. What's important for us is for the range to be as wide as possible. And I think that's the most important thing. Museum professionals need to see that it's possible to envision increasing the temperature up to 26 degrees. That's a huge step forward. And then practically speaking, I'm not a specialist in objects. I know that depending on the spaces, depending on the objects, you're going to need to be a lot more careful. But the aim is to say that the range is larger than it was before and the variants themselves will be defined more specifically. We're going to continue now. We're going to be stopping their questions and answers for now. 
But just to go back to INP and the training, I would like uh, to give INP the opportunity to respond to this. I work with master's programs at the Ecole du Louvre and INP, and these matters are discussed. There's the initial conservator training that I work in with a course on works transport. This is for future curators, sorry, and they are asking a lot of questions about this issue. Let us continue now with Anna Bourges. Uh, you are a research engineer at the Center of Restoration and Research in France. Uh, you received a diploma in uh, materials in uh, 2017, and uh, you are leading the working group on climate and heritage. You also lead the AFNOR group on the standardization of cultural goods, inorganic porous materials constituting cultural heritage. I have a question for you, obviously. So how can architectural innovations lead us to a new vision of conservation? Over to you, Anne. Good evening, everybody, and thank you uh, for that introduction. I hope that this presentation is going to be good for you. Yes, thank you for this introduction, because yes, I have two hats here. I am a researcher and engineer, engineer within the Museums of France at the Ministry of Culture, but I'm also active as the Secretary of Ecomus France, and so I'm representing both these institutions today and this uh, double hat as well is helped me to think about architecture in terms of its uh, climatic issues and perhaps we can look at the next slide and if we want to focus not only on the energy crisis but also on climate change and that's something that's important that we need to be aware of we need to think and understand these issues within that context and understand that heritage, regardless of the type of heritage, whether it's cultural heritage, natural heritage, material heritage, is impacted by climate change. You know, of course, the reports of the IPCC, which projects these different scenarios with uh, different ranges. The blue line is the ideal line, is the ideal scenario in terms of carbon uh, emissions and um, greenhouse gases. We're expecting that, we're wanting that to platform out between now and, and 2100. And otherwise, the, there's a catastrophic option where if we do nothing, we'll end up with completely uncontrollable and exponential situations. You generally, the truth is between the two somewhere because we're trying to act at the moment, but we're not yet at full capacity, I think. So next slide, please. So based with these observations, you know these reports of the IPCC and there's been an understanding recently of impact on heritage, which had really been completely forgotten, forgotten from these different uh, reports. So since 2020, 2022, it's starting to feature in reports and also in the different agreements and conferences. And we're having a a gathering of different ad hoc groups that are being formed and led by ICOMAS and UNESCO internationally, which are going to lead to a, a certain number of reflections, which in the COP26 and the COP27 were taken into account. So these are papers that have come out of these different events which talk about the vulnerability of heritage and also the lack and the needs for research that we have and we need to develop. Next slide, please. So in the face of these different issues which are very real, there's an objective which is the 
European Green Deal, which has been uh, passed and then modified by the COP21 in 2015. And there's this goal of zero carbon emissions by 2050. Of course, there's a number of intermediary steps, which is seeing by 2030 a reduction of 50 to 55 percent in previous presentations we've seen initiatives that are aiming even higher with um much higher levels which is something that's very positive but for the ministry of the culture and the government we're looking for a 10 percent reduction by 2024 next slide please so in order to act so it's a good thing to have the desire to act, but in order to do anything, we need to identify the levers. And so this is where we can see that the buildings and architecture are a key issue, because when we see the different sectors here in France, it's the building sector that actually um, is the highest emitter of greenhouse gases and also a consumer of energy. So on top of the climate crisis, there is the energy crisis, which is really adding urgency but before the energy crisis france had put in place a law and a national strategy for low carbon with environmental regulations now we're talking about standards within legislation there are standards for buildings now and this is the environmental regulation from 20 regulations pardon sorry from 2020 and this has been applicable since the 1st of January 2022. It doesn't impact, uh, it is for the moment, it impacts new construction, so it doesn't affect us for the moment, but it is going to change the situation. Next slide, please. So this, these reg regulations um, include the calculation of a life cycle. So we're obviously trying to take that into account in all of our work at the moment so these life cycles involve measuring carbon emissions at each level from the extraction of materials transport because the transport as well of works that would be included also the installation which is going to require certain energy and then the life of the building its use and this is the operational carbon which is calculated over 50 years, and then there needs to be a consideration of the recyclability of this building. When we think about the life cycle and our built heritage, we can think that it's actually fairly virtuous because we've already extracted the materials and built the building. So there's just a single um, point here, which is the operational approach and the way in which the building is used so we come back to museums here where we also want to connect into what's going on inside and also what's going on outside but there's we need to think about consumption and how we use the building this is the highest uh, level of energy consumption on this uh, item of the life cycle and this is even more true for old buildings we hear this phrase going around in france passoire thermique which means a, a thermal um a thermal sieve where just energy is just running through next slide please but we are seeing that there are studies that are being done researchers who are working on these questions and they're looking at the influence of renovation on old buildings and you can see that actually renovating improves the energy consumption energy efficiency is good to renovate old buildings to make it uh, give it to reduce its energy consumption but renovating needs to uh, take place on a on a from a basis and actually the longer that we keep the building is more it becomes more virtuous so actually maintaining buildings and conserving buildings is environmentally friendly it's already an, a green activity because it's the construction of buildings that actually consumes the most energy so 
with this energy crisis, we really do have an enormous issue here because renovation with the climate law, which was passed this summer in France, is encouraging owners to renovate their buildings so that they get a better energy score. We have these energy scores that go from D, that we have D, E, and F in the thermal regulations where people are being encouraged to renovate, but we need to encourage people to renovate well, because if people do it quickly, it doesn't always mean that we do it well, and we can lose um, advantages that we have in terms of heritage and that the Ministry of Culture and iCommerce, we're trying to review um, the conservation of buildings and give good arguments for encouraging uh, energy renovation. Um, we're trying to bring good sense into all of this that doesn't lead to destroying heritage we are working within the ministry to standardize and offer standards so that we can regulate and give recommendations and guides for architects and owners and for business so that we can serve 80 percent of what is already built in particular structures and frontages which are usually classified as historical buildings. You've got an excellent ex recent exhibition here, which is at the Pavilion of the Arsenal, and which is about uh, conserving, transforming, and passing on. And this is something that's really very important. And there's just these few exhibitions here. The fact that it's an exhibition means that this is not yet a mainstream practice. We have these buildings that conserve 80% of what's already built and within them, inside, they change uh, and they renovate in order to develop new structures. So you can see that here with this building, which is conserving uh, the structure uh, that was classified from the beginning. So this is, we need not to oppose energy re renovation and conserving heritage. We can conserve and also have a good energy uh, score and energy renovation. And we can comply with a positive energy score while also conserving our heritage. And of course, the low carbon work is connects into heritage. So here we have a transformation of a building. It was a car park, an underground park, car park into a place where people live and where there are offices. So the uses change and the in, inside structure changes. So this is the an interpretation of the Swiss architect, Philip Ram, who has also got an there's also an exhibition, which is included in the exhibition at the Arsenal, and he shows how architects create climates, and we can use architecture to create indoor climates. We need to draw them rather than geometric um, forms. We can see in this building that we recover rainwater, we have vegetation as well, which enables evapotranspiration and, and helps with indoor comfort without air conditioning in order to stabilize without active energy inputs. We can also try and change these climates by using different techniques and heritage has an experienced this for a, a long time. Here's a passive heating approach, which comes from um, the architect Jacques Michel in the 1970s that shows how a solar, uh, the solar uh, rays heat 
a, a glass panel which then heats a wall and naturally, passively, communicates heat within the building. On the right, you've also got this example of contemporary architecture, which uses this same approach with a modern type of architecture using earthen walls, which is a biomaterial, in order to redistribute this heat in a passive way within the building. Next slide, please. So these materials we've talked about, earth, and we know about these bio-based materials. We know the old heritage. We know that we've had earth for thousands of years. This was the first construction material used in architecture and also for writing. It's a material that's very uh, sensitive. It's one of the first materials that is very difficult to conserve within museums. And this is something that has been mod modernized and maybe modified by some with some natural polymers. So I'm thinking of cellulose fibers that are used sometimes in research in order to activate new areas and have new applications for construction and modern construction and also to be used in humidity transfer and thermal regulation within buildings. So this building is important. This is what we're working within ICOMOS. So we've got a building and we can create indoor climates, but this building is within an urban area within an, an an urban island and we have to see the building within its context we're not just focused on a, the architecture of a building we're also thinking about the whole area around because it's going to depend on its on its own environment which is going to be influenced and it's going to be is going to influence as well we talk a lot about heat islands and we're trying to reduce heat islands and transform them into cool islands what we're wanting to do is is to at the moment people are working either on urban heat islands or on energy renovation but there's not very much work that's done between these two concepts and this is something that needs to be done in our professions to bring connections between these different levels and to consider buildings within their architectural and urban environment. So all of this leads us to think about new ways of conser conservation, because if we can impact architectural envelopes, if and if we can create climates within an environment, we can succeed in controlling uh, uh, more or less we, and, and capture and list the effects of the kim impact on indoor areas in order to consume less energy. So there are examples here. There's a very interesting example in Switzerland at the center of collections of the Swiss National Museums which is almost entirely autonomous uh, from an energy perspective. And there's also the Louvre Conservation Center in Lievin. I saw in the comments er earlier, people were asking whether we could conserve underground and actually some of the reserves here are underground and this impacts the stability of the climate. The building is not autonomous, but it does have an impact on its energy consumption. This is also a solution, earth, earthen materials and using them in architecture and building underground does provide real stability. And then there are museums that fit into their environment, which will include the landscape in their environment. So here's a real change of scale and a re-evaluation of architecture. So 
this leads us to bringing together all these different scales and thinking about whether we need to uh, require certain environments or do we need to better understand the environment as it is and understand its potential and um, renovate the indoors depending on the environment that's there. This is perhaps another approach, which is a complementary approach. It's perhaps not the only approach we're going to have. But on the left, you've got a thermal representation of a whole volume. And you can see that there's an unequal distribution here. So rather than um, air conditioning the whole area, we could just work on the spaces that we really need to focus on. And we could put in place like thermal curtains like we see here or innovative materials which help us to control these effects across the volume. So indoors, we've talked a little bit about this. The most important issues are condensation issues. That's why we do air conditioning. But if we try and understand what we're wanting to limit in terms of deterioration. We need to understand the needs of conservation and in what conditions we're going to have condensation. These are these conditions are unique. All different materials have different reactions. Next slide, please. I'm just coming to the end now, really. So we need to study how works are going to respond to a different situations if they don't have air conditioning, for example. So we need to think about the impact of climate change. Think We need to think about this context of climate change and think about the significant variations that are going to in be increased as we go forward. We're going to have very high temperatures with very intense wet weather events and how is that going to impact the conservation of our works that may not just be stable works but may also be uh, uh, castles and palaces and museums places that are not controlled and that may vary with the external climate so that we need to see more research in this area really so we're showing that including heritage, all heritage, whether it's museum heritage or architecture heritage in this climate tr transition is not just a link to the energy crisis, but it needs to be taken into account at a multi-scale and multidisciplinary level and include the content in its, in its container, the envelope, the architectural env envelope that, that it that um, holds it and work on this envelope and consider it within its urban environment and within its landscape. Here you have the example. The final image here is a museum, a museum on an archaeological site, which is included in a natural landscape and has been very much impacted by climate change. So there's here a transposal of all the different levels and we need to have this cross-cutting approach looking at climate change and its impact on heritage with all the um, research areas as well. So we've got this cross-cutting aspect of these different uh, skills and professions. We have research, we need to measure so that we can anticipate needs we need to integrate innovation with prototypes and new materials. We need to redesign the use of innovative materials for conservation. That applies as well to museum conservation so that we can change practices. Everything fits together. We have to have recommendations and we have to have everything agreed up front. So thank you very much for your attention. And that's it, really. Thank you very much, Anne. Your talk reminded us of the importance of the envelope of the building so that um, 
we can uh, ensure that external climate control is in place. So there's also the importance of renovating older buildings. This is an issue that uh, we need to consider in terms of building integrity. These are essential issues. Sorry, there are some microphones that are still switched on. If you could just turn your microphones off, thank you. We're now going to hand over to Frédéric Ladonne. And after the three, uh, these three final talks, I will be handing over for a time of question and answer. Let me do introduce Frédéric before I hand over to him. You are an architect and programmer in the programming and construction of cultural facilities. You have a master's degree in preventive conservation and a master's degree in high environmental quality engineering. You have programmed more than 100 projects, supervised the design of the Louvre Museum's Conservation Center, the reserves of the Fine Arts Museum in T Dijon and Tours, and carried out studies for the collections and reserves of the CANAP, the Pablo Picasso National Museum, and the Army Museum, among others. You teach at the École du Louvre and at the French National Heritage Institute, the INP, at the University of Paris, one on the issue of reserves and the relationship between the building and the heritage collection. So I have a question for you, Frédéric. How can we reduce energy consumption by acting on the building, what specific requirements do you have in terms of construction and renovation of buildings? I am often used to thinking about uh, questions. I'm going to perhaps remove my hat as a member of ICOM to think about my role as an architect, as someone working in construction. We receive climatic requirements. We are forced to comply with them. And there are questions raised here. And I was working with um, someone last week uh, saying, OK, I, I have uh, 500,000 euros in budget, but this is going to cost 2 million. So with the energy bills now, so what do I do? What do I cut? And these are the challenges that our elected officials are now facing. I'm not therefore going to be talking uniquely about construction, but about the approaches that we have around this area. I give a class on construction and environmental issues where energy takes um, plays a major role. Let me show you a metaphor using clothing. So producing energy is good. But if I take if I take clothing, for instance, there's a shop where I can get a voucher to buy a new piece of clothing if I give back old clothing. And I think the buildings are similar when we're talking about energy conservation. When we're talking about energy efficiency, we're talking about insulation. And in construction, to, to give the example of uh, of, of uh, clothes, clothing, we can have a, a pair of jeans that's in 100% French cotton, for instance, that doesn't take as much water to wash it. But then the real question that we need to be asking ourselves is, do we need to buy this clothing at all? And this is also true for buildings. So we need to be thinking about this. Let's look at this next slide now. So the energy increase uh, has existed for, for over a year now, the, the graph that I'm showing you. 
and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm seeing museums thinking about this increasingly because of this large increase. We could think about the 40 to 60% of relative humidity, like David was saying, about the temperature that we need. We found these collections in a state where people weren't considering this. And we've been very, very kind to our collections, and I'll show you how. So the first thing that we need to do to have an approach on climatic requirements is to try to differentiate between the typology of collections, collections that need tailored climate or a one-size-fits-all climate, as it was said by Anne earlier, a more general climate. I'm going to be working more on this, and you will see in the examples later that it's, it's better if we can have 120 square meters of climate controlled area rather than 800,000. I think it's about having something that's coherent. We're working on the Chateau de Versailles at the moment and its reserves with uncontrolled climate areas. Do we need an air conditioned conservation area? I personally don't think so, but we're going to be as careful as possible with our collections. Can I move on to the next slide, please? Stefan Mikowski was, um, Mikowski was cited earlier. And uh, Ellen has put some information in the chat. There's notes from A to D here, which gives us some sense of responsibility or guilt with this prudence at the start. But this is leading us to the challenges that we have at the moment. But if we have humidity below 75%, we're preventing excessive humidity. And the temperature will rarely exceed 32 and is often below 25 degrees. And I'm preventing the majority of risks. This isn't too bad. So instead of having this drive for excellence with quite weak measures, we could start with this idea of guaranteeing the minimum that we need for our collections. So let me question a couple of issues around this. Next slide, please. So earlier, you were talking about these effects. We're conducting a study at the moment with the Lambert collection, where we had simulations of building behavior in Avignon. And we were looking at what would happen if uh, we switch the 24 degree to 26 degree uh, requirement. There's not especially, this building is not especially environmentally friendly. But if we switch from 24 degrees to 26 degrees for a set point, this is the same data that David provided earlier. There's 17% immediate savings. This is how we can consume less. We need to be re-questioning our conservation conditions and our requirements. So we're talking about range here. And if we can look at the next slide, please. So when we have programs, we need to start thinking about certain points. This statue is four meters, 34 centimeters, and now it's five meters. And there's a big difference. 
we're repeating what we have learnt without necessarily verifying it. And we've been considering whether our requirements are the right or not. Yes, we might agree that part of our buildings need air conditioning, climate control, but we have three set points that we often have. We have fresh air so that we can breathe. This is a regulatory requirement, which is from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 volume per hour so that we can breathe. We need ventilation. Then we have this notion of air circulation, which was actually from archives, but it's repeated in museums, which means that three times an hour, we push the air around the room to avoid any areas where there's stale air or instances of accumulation of water. And this can prevent stratification as well. And then there is the climate. We have these set points of 20 degrees, plus or minus one degrees, 50% relative humidity, 5% allowance over 24 hours. With these three set points, I am going to have to use a machine. We have thermodynamic simulations. I'm sorry that this is quite technical, but this was also what I was asked to provide. So we have a dynamic simulation where we model the building, as Anne showed earlier on one of the pictures of the thermal imaging camera. We have a dynamic simulation with water, with rain, weather, what happens if we insulate, what variations there are. So here we look at whether the floor is insulated, and you can see two different results. And as our Swiss colleagues showed, that uh, insulation can sometimes lead to better conditions. This is quite common in urban design. Fresh air rates. Let me give you an example from Switzerland, where we're talking about air circulation and temperature. At the top is an example from a Swiss museum. Thierry Jacou, who works as a consultant, provided this. There's temperature variation in red, in blue, it's high um, relative humidity, and in gray, it's humidity outdoors. Obviously, variation outdoors is much greater than indoors. If we look at absolute humidity, which is independent of temperature, the two overlap. This means that the humidity variations that I have indoors are related to outdoors because we're bringing in fresh air. Fresh air is calculated as 25 cubic meters per person. So if I have 5,000 cubic meters, which means that there are 1,000 um, cubic meters of exhibition space, that's 200 people, so I need 5,000 cubic meters per hour. And it's difficult to have climate control with fresh air being pumped in, as I do not always have 200 people within the exhibition room. Sometimes we can be uh, all alone if we're there on a Tuesday in November, for instance. There will not be 200 people there. So the first issue about energy conservation is about what we need. I've been working with a lot of muse museum climate data and fresh air is responsible for a large number of disturbances and variations. I will be coming back to that later. And CO2 testing uh, can help us, sensors can help us manage that. We were working for four years on this 20,000 square meter conservation center for the Louvre. This is bioclimatic architecture, which is ideal and beneficial. And we're going to be looking 
at the three set points. We had set points that were a little bit more flexible than the traditional standard. We're not having 20 degrees, we're having a range. I think it was 16 to 24 and 40 to 60 relative humidity and 5% uh, of the time there could be variations in that. Unlike as we thought, you can see there's a uh, pie chart on the left and within that pie chart, you can see the presumed consumption of the building. It's 63%, which is uniquely for air circulation. And that's 63% of consumption just to circulate air indoors to avoid stratification and temperature variations. This is a region in France called Eau de France, and they, we have decided to do a simulation with the idea of having some sensors at one meter, 2.5 meters and four meters to measure the temperature and the relative humidity. And we saw that there was almost no stratification because there's a thermal motor. So if we do nothing, there's no stratification. So let me go back to the Swiss museum reserves that we mentioned earlier. We visited in 2008 where we saw that there was 0.15 air circulation per hour rather than three, which is a huge saving. You can see that there's heating, cooling, humidification, dehumidification, lighting, ventilation, except 63%. And the Swiss Museum's reserve has understood this with 0.15 per hour instead of three per hour. Let's move forward now. This is the new collections uh, conservation center, Collectie Centrum in the Netherlands. And there are three or four museums that have their collections conserved here. You can see on the bottom, I would like to move forward now and you'll be very surprised that the cladding indoors is very similar to apartment ventilation cladding. They've completely abandoned air circulation machines. And I would have loved to have been able to work on that. I do not know if we have any colleagues from the Netherlands here today, but I would love to know more information about this. We've been talking about energy conservation. There's no electricity in the reserve here. Let's move on to the next slide. This is an example that's going to call on a lot of different examples that you've seen already. This is on Reunion Islands in an industrial collection center. There's a lot of furniture collections very decorative furniture from the Indian Ocean. And uh, marketry work as well. These are conserved at around 20 degrees at the moment. And this is in a hangar. There are, there's climate control at 20 degrees. And here, if there's a problem, if there's a problem with the air conditioning, you go straight from 20 to 26 up to 28 even, which is far from the set point. So we have a large meeting here, uh, a large uh, warehouse, sorry, 580 square meters, seven meters high. And we're thinking about this large volume here. Someone says instantly, can we, have air conditioning across all of this. Let's move on to the next uh, slide now. 
So we have a temperature and humidity sensor, and I'm sorry, but my graph has not appeared on the screen, but we had seven months of monitoring where it was completely flat. And the only peak was due to a cyclone. And we then look at a number of different criteria. If we wanted 24 degrees, there's around two degrees over 24 hours in terms of variation. 12% of the time we had relative humidity conditions that were over what we wanted. So we have between 45 to 65% of relative humidity at 95% of the time with temperatures between 22 and 30 degrees. And we're looking at this, you can see this here at the bottom with all of our different data sets, 90% of the time we have 22 to 30 degrees and 45 to 65% relative humidity. And we're therefore no longer required to use climate control. All of our values are between 45 and 65, not even 45 to 68. And we were talking earlier about perhaps changing some of the ranges. This is possible. We're able to distinct distinguish between different uh, collections and the conservation conditions that they require. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague uh, Florence, who will be speaking very briefly about this um, concept of ranges. I have one final slide. I know that we're running short of time, but I just wanted to remind you that it's good to act without guilt. We need to be constantly rethinking about conservation conditions, distinguishing between collections, being flexible in our conservation ranges. And we need to have this rationale of stability rather than set points. And if we have buildings that are over 65% uh, relative humidity, we're going to have to have climate control. But if you insulate, then I think we're going to be able to have a tolerance of 4 to 5% variation with these uh, newer corridor ranges. I think that it will be fine, even with a fully passive building. I don't know where I'm at in terms of timing. Next slide, please. I'm going to stop there. We just uh, looked at some bio-sourced materials, new uh, concrete that we're using on a couple of projects, which can meet a number of different requirements which means that there's only a 4 to 5% uh, variation rate in terms of the defined range of relative humidity. This is a new, a new option within bioclimatic architecture. And uh, unfortunately, if we're not providing passive uh, relative humidity, we're going to have to switch over to climate control. I feel that you're perhaps a little bit uh, anxious in terms of uh, time, but there are still 267 people here, so everything is working well technically. You uh, almost uh, introduced Florence Bertin yourself. Uh, allow me to introduce her. You're a conservator specialized in metal. For 20 years, you've directed a conservation and restoration laboratory in Compiègne. In 2011, you joined the Restoration and Research Center of the Museums of France as a consultant restorer. And then you became assistant to the director of studies of the Department of Restorers of the French National Heritage Institute. 
In 2014, you were appointed director of the Conservation, Restoration and Preventive Conservation Department of the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris. In addition, you coordinate and intervene in various training courses at the French Heritage Institute and you co-direct the Masters of Conservation and Preventive Conservation at the Ecole du Louvre. I have a question for you, obviously. What are some of the things to watch out for when extending the climate control ranges? Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frédéric. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Econ France asked me to present this work, which will help us to get out of the thermal ranges. This is a work that we did at the Nissan de Commando Museum. This is a difficult building, like Anne was talking about earlier. I haven't really got any solutions for improving practices, but collections have been there for a century, to repeat what Frédéric was was saying, and it's a historic building that's fully furnished with all the classic characteristics of furniture, art, pieces of art, works of art, and furniture. Everything must remain as it is. The air is heated. There is no humidity uh, processing. This is an an old classical building, a bit like what we saw with Versailles earlier on. There are a lot of windows that uh, face onto the garden and and they have very old um, frames and they are not very well sealed. If we observe the external climate, like you said, saw Frederick, you, we saw the humidity in November was between 60 and 95 percent with variations and we can see an inertia of the building. If we look at the curves for these different rooms, three different rooms, the library, the office, and the Moses bedroom with variations of 37 to 56%. So we have 14 sensors spread across the different spaces. We've got 1,200 square meters of X exhibition areas and the sensors are followed by my colleagues Catherine and Cécile, we asked ourselves how were we going to consider the climate in this historical building in terms of humidity it's not very controlled and it's very difficult to control and in fact we've had to refuse to set uh, humidity thresholds even with high ranges because we just can't do it and we have no system to do that so we went towards a study of climate shocks in order to understand the stability of the building and move really away from humidity values sorry that was the right slide so how do we qualify what we might call a climate shock so over 24 hours D david villon was talking about um, plus or minus eight percent of relative humidity but in our uh, building we were wanting to go for five percent with shocks at ten percent but of course there are shocks that hit 15 or 20 percent depending on the fragility of collections, we thought that we would study shocks that were over 10% across a 24-hour period. If we consider, thank you, that's the right slide. What you can see here are the figures from the library in November. So you can see here that there are three climate shocks of over 10% over a 25-hour period. First of all, on the 23rd of November, from 39 to 52%. On the 25th, we went from 52 to 40. And the 5th of December, we had 46 to 35. So if we present the variations with a graph that Catherine produced this afternoon, we can visualize the discrepancy of variations and the gap, the change in variations each uh, line is a day in November. And we can see that on the 1st of November, variations are between 49 and 60%. And we can see across the whole month, the trend in these variations. But in order to characterize these spaces, we decided not to work with these trends and values, but rather to count daily shocks 
So in this example, this is the upper ground floor. We counted six shocks over over 10 percent. And when we put these shocks across the different 14 sensors, we could see that all of these 14 sensors in January gave us zero shocks in the library and 11 in the former Nissim office, which gives us across the year 15 as a minimum to 101 as a maximum. And so we can see the most unstable area of the building. So how do we set the cursor how, in terms of how serious a, a shock is? So any shock can be dangerous, but as we can see with the results that we've had, we can't do anything about it because everything will be dangerous at that time. But so we have between zero, we have between zero and 12 shocks every month. So we decided to say that we would say between zero and four shocks would be acceptable and five to 10 would be concerning and over 10 shocks every month would be high risk zones. So next slide, please. So with this scale, we can present for each room and for each month a pre present presentation of climate behavior and where we have high risk areas, you can see them here in red. So we've got the former Nissim office in January and February, uh, the former Nissim bedroom in February. So this enables us to visualize the state of the building and the behavior of the building. Next slide, please. So the curve that I showed you is for the uh, ground floor upper gallery, which had six shocks. And this put us at the intermediate value. So if we look at that across the year and across these different seasons, we thought it would be easier to categorize in this way. We can see that the Nissim uh, bedroom is, uh, the Moses bedroom is red all year long. So this is the highest risk zone for collections without even looking at relative humidity levels. In terms of the library just above, it's green all year round. So this scale uh, helps us to produce maps of the building. And so you can see this, uh, you can see that number three is, uh, sorry, the library is green. Number four is the uh, Moses bedroom, which is red. So here we can see by season, the behavior of the whole building. So you can see the library in green. You can see the Nissim bedroom in red. You can see that then other areas go from red to yellow to green at different parts of the year. So this is interesting from a learning perspective, but also from the perspective of managing collections. So if we had changed this uh, categorization level, or this because it was fairly arbitrary what we chose. If you can see in the table above, uh, this is the cursor that we've just seen below 15, between 16 and 19 and over 20. And we can see that the small office changes it with the table below. We changed the cursor, we lowered it. So in green, we put everything that was under 10. Uh, yellow was intermediate between 11, 15 and over 16 was major. And with this new categorization, the small office becomes um, more concerning. So the more severe we are with the office, we can see different things. Sorry, this is the Moses bedroom, which has not changed because it was red before. And then with a more severe cursor, it's going to be red all the time. So then we decided to be even more severe and we thought that if we consider the fragility of particular works, we might think that anything over five shocks per season would be concerning. And as you can see, that means the whole museum basically is red. But this 
this cursor helps us to identify the most stable areas, but it doesn't help us to distinguish between them. So the cursor that we ended up choosing gave us these values and this situation seemed to us to categorize the spaces counting only shocks, which is different from what we've seen just an, until now. And they helped us to identify the most dangerous and high risk areas and to work on those areas. And this might be focused particularly over certain months because we can do this across a number of years to see where the concerning months are. This helps us to target uh, climate work or to have reasons for improving the building to reduce the just general poor building, which is um, poorly insulated and target the areas where we're going to have the highest number of shocks because this is a, monitoring. This is an important part of our role. I, I've been very quick. I wanted to try and uh, catch time back, catch up back up on the time a little bit. So we are able to identify the highest risk areas. It's been very interesting to focus in on this question of shocks as a standard. This might be something that would be interesting to think about for buildings that don't have air, air treatment, particularly in terms of humidity. And so rather than thinking about ranges, um, I think that focusing in on ranges in a building like this with the values is really just very complicated. We wouldn't be able to maintain this kind of building within um, humid humidity ranges, even the broadest ones suggested by Frederick just five minutes ago. So where we extend, uh, where it's difficult to stay within humidity ranges, I wonder whether it would be good to suggest these um, recommendations in terms of acceptable climate shocks. This is perhaps not about loans, but because it's different for things that are traveling, but for objects that are permanently exhibited, I think in terms of acceptable or non-acceptable or, or threatened uh, shocks, this seemed like a very interesting idea and a reasonable a reflection in terms of ensuring that we were properly monitoring the collections and do the very best that we could in a difficult situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florence. Thank you very much. Before hearing from the audience for one, two or three questions, Florence, Will you be publishing your work? Yes, we need to dig a bit deeper because I haven't mentioned this, but this started with a student from the Ecole du, du Louvre. She was on one of the slides, but I, I didn't mention it. I really like this approach and I'd like it to, to be extended over a number of years. Here we've just got results for one year. I think it would be interesting to use this to to view climate behavior that may or may be considered acceptable or not thank you florence frederic has raised the ha his hand just to, to to be clear i haven't recommended uh, ranges but i was just suggesting we could move ranges and and we had suggested this before to the CNRF and they approved the moving the range because we were going in the in the right way, but they didn't have all the stability that was requested. Thank you, Frederick. So there are 254 of us connected right now. Are there any questions? I'm just going to look through the chat. Um, Pierre Emmanuel Nebo, I don't know if we're going to be able to find the answer today, which is how are we going to manage to convince uh, politicians and uh, 
um, building owners and project managers to get out of these um, this showy architecture for museums, which are often very difficult to handle in terms of climate, in terms of operational costs as well. I'm afraid I don't really have an answer, says Federic. Unfortunately, it's often our, our collections are abandoned at the time of the selection of uh, an architectural competition. Perhaps I could say something. This is actually the work that we need to do. We need to work together on conserving uh, the conservation role of museums and architectural bids. And that's something that's important for us to do. And it also involves um, the kind of work that we're doing now, talking together and and helping people to understand issues, whether that be conservators or architects. So I think it's really important to, to talk about these issues. Yeah, I'm talking about people in general. Of course, training is an issue, a key issue here. Over to Mr. Ezrati. So the question of convincing politicians is an old question. It's now that politicians can't do anything other than trying to avoid these questions, perhaps uh, not at presidential level, but at the local authority level, they have no option but to act in this way. In the past, we always talked about the biggest obstacle being the administration, etc. But now, it's the administrations and the politicians who are absolutely obliged by the public to move towards more energy conservation. So actually, again, this crisis is an opportunity which is forcing them to think differently. So thank you very much. Perhaps just a final question before the conclusion for Florence. I am, I've lost uh, the flow of the questions. Does the state of the offering confirm that it's relevant to take into account these different uh, shocks because the state of the building may be difficult everywhere. Have you seen that where there have been most shocks that the works have actually been of most affected? Thank you very much for this question. And we haven't actually got enough uh, observations of the collections in order to uh, see a correlation. It will take me some time to give you the answers to this. But as I was saying at the introduction, the works have been there for over 100 years. Of course, there is damage and there has been damage. I haven't got any statistics about the highest shocks. For the moment, I use this uh, data for monitoring and to raise awareness. And a question from Pierre-Emmanuel Nebarg, Florence, what markers have you envisaged for monitoring and how are you going to affect, uh, carry out this monitoring over time? Um, it, it, it's observations, observations of the works that we know best and of the most fragile works in each of the areas. Thank you, Florence. It's 8.48 p.m. There are 243 of us. I think it's probably time for the conclusion. So I'll hand over to Hélène for the conclusion. Thank you so much, uh, Sandrine. Uh, I will be attempting to conclude this session. We are aiming to wrap up by 8 p.m. as promised. Uh, to kick things off, I would like to cite Bruno Latour. And uh, we often remind ourselves of what he said. Evidence is never evident. The indiscutable is always discussed, at least at the start. 
This is an extract from the six letters of scientific humanities. And I think that this is a great illustration of our debate this evening and the challenges that we are facing together. This evening, just to remind you, is part of a context of sustainability, which is now closely linked to, to heritage. There's a living component of this linked to eco economics. And there's an explicit need to address the new challenges that are going beyond traditional conservation with the definition of uh, sustainable development from a report in 1987 brought back in 1992 is about ensuring that as present generations, we are not compromising the ability of future generations to continue living. And we're talking about economically fair and ecologically sustainable. And in uh, 1973, we saw natural and human ecology were linked and part of museums' missions which was brought up by the, the Club de Rome um, and then uh, brought back into our consciousness in the 90s. The waste, uh, the depletion of natural resources, pollution, and these are things that we need to think about when thinking about the museum of the future. This transforms the way that we consider heritage and sustainability and to act in these two fields. Firstly, the crisis context, which is catastrophic, meaning that we have to take into account this notion of sustainability and establish new variables and new priorities. And secondly, the founding principles of sustainable development through the 17 sustainable development goals, the SDGs adopted by the UN in 2015. Think about the model of museums, think about this sobriety, energy conservation that we have mentioned a lot, which is taken up in the third part of the IPCC report. We're thinking about the fundamentals of museum professionals and how this was presented this evening. There are requirements that are amplifying the contradiction, the deep contradiction between the world of museums in the 90s and noughties and the slowdown which is imposed by the current situation. It calls into question the resilience of our heritage institutions on how they reconcile sustainability environmentally friendliness and museum. These key words echo our responsibility in terms of conservation and the passing down of heritage, risk prevention, cultural integrity, long-term sustainability, sobriety. We saw this evening that professions in conservation are being reconfigured in order to reconcile activities and professional work with these challenges. What tools are available? What levers and obstacles are there? Can we have greater sobriety in our practices? Yes, but how? The theory of sustainability leads heritage professionals like ourselves to better conserve heritage while remaining aware of the cultural impact of heritage on our different societies, as Frédéric Ladonne, Florence Bertin, and Anne Borges were saying. We're thinking about built heritage through technology, the design of reserves, and the sustainability of collections. When thinking about the conception, conservation of the future, we're going to need to think in terms of compromise. Let me cite uh, Jean-François 
director of Heritage, who was working at the Centre Pompidou at a conference last September, he said, I think that we need to believe in the people on the ground and to give a framework and then apply prescriptions and instructions at a local level. And in order to find the best possible compromise, a compromise on strict conservation standards, compromise on the use of materials, and a compromise on consumption itself, should we stop buying, as Frédéric Ladon was saying earlier. This results in a necessary compromise between what is desirable, e economically profitable, technically possible, culturally viable and societally acceptable. Caitlin said in her first talk that we need to practice what we preach and take a collective concerted approach, encouraging museums to take leadership on these issues. I can recall three aspects from Caitlin's first talk. Guidelines should be a process, not numbers. Teamwork and collaboration are key. It's about a collective effort. We need a certain boldness to make change, boldness, audacity. David, Natalie and Katerina said that we have seen incredible mobilization of German and Swiss museums around climate issues, particularly the initiative of these climate corridors, uh, as they say in German. I'm going to remember this term in order to extend uh, climate control in museums and the ranges applied. We could test this in France in our museums and carry this within ICOM France, for instance. We need to go to the stably safe combined with the one size fits all approach. The climate of the future is the result of collaborative work assessed and developed by the professional community that we form renovating will allow us to improve our carbon footprint and this is already a green step we need to use our common sense and conserve in a way that uses less energy this point came up in all of the talks that we need to promote a multidisciplinary approach to heritage, taking into account the cross-sectoral nature of our different professions, developing actions, changing practices, and training all of the different professions. Allow me to finish by citing Stefan Mikalski at the International Conference on Climate Control, which was held in December understand globally and engage locally and act locally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this evening. I'm going to hand back over to Sandrine to wrap up. Thank you so much, Hélène. I was delighted to be able to moderate this evening once again. The talks have been very enriching and informative. Just reading the chat box is incredible. Any questions that we have not been able to ask live will be passed on to the speakers. It is 8.59 p.m. I'm going to hand over to our president very briefly, Emily. Yes, just uh, to wish you a good night. So, thank you so much to all of the speakers. Thank you, Sandrine and Hélène, for the quality of this event. I think that the comments raining down in the chat box uh, demonstrate the interest that we all have in this topic. That's uh, something we want to bring to the front 
at the forefront at the moment and we're looking for solutions in order to make progress. I'm delighted to have seen everybody's enthusiasm and the sincerity with which everybody spoke and shared their experiences. Thank you very much to all of you. I wish you a good evening and uh, see you soon. Bye bye.